Cool. Always takes me a while to figure out these things. So today it's the uh, hanged man. And the uh, truncated tree is a universal mother symbol. And the hanged man enclosed by twin trees. And the gibbet above can be seen as enclosed in kind of a coffin. His contact with the maternal underground waters suggests new life. Nature may hold him so that he may emerge from her womb reborn. As an initiation though, he will first have to survive the experience. The initiation of this sort occurs when we've reached the end of the phase and life demands a transition to new ways. We must entrust ourselves to the unseen and new ways of life. Our old behavior patterns can no longer keep us upright. Life has now pulled the rug from underneath us. We feel suspended between worlds. We can now only wait and pray. When our consciousness is in opposition to the collective, our viewpoint can appear as a traitor to the establishment. This individual can then be held to many trials. His life as a useful citizen is thus suspended. He now dangles as seen in the card. The lover also dramatizes a trial. The lover is boxed in by two women on either side. The resolution for the lover comes from the winged arrows figure in the sky above, but for the hangman, immobilized by two powerful maternal symbols, can only find inspiration from the depths. Externally, he is immobilized, but deep inside there stirs a dance of liberation. Faced with ultimate realities, the non-essential encumbrances drop away. The Egyptian god Osiris hung from a tree like butcher's meat until he was ripe for dismemberment. Odin hung from a tree for nine days to divine the ruins. Our old selves must rot and fall away. Many things can bring about this experience of dangling of being forlorn. The love may betray us, our faith may fail us, we may be immobilized by an illness. Young viewed the situation pictured in the hanging man. Oh, um, as an invitation to plumb the new depths of being, a challenge rather than a punishment. To quote, for the unconscious always tries to produce an impossible situation in order to force the individual to bring out his very best. Otherwise, one stops short of one's best. One is not complete one does not realize oneself. What is needed is an impossible situation where one has to renounce one's own will and one's own wit and do nothing but trust to the impersonal power of growth and development. So we must sacrifice our former ways of understanding and acting. Many of the old gods have fallen from the tree. One of them being the image of life is the ever good and beneficent mother that will protect us from mishap and nourish our every whim. We have been disconnected from our roots, our ego shattered. Our need is now to descend. Our conscious ego can no longer save us. If we can succeed in this trip to the depths, this alchemical process, the hangman may invert and dance a jig of joy Otherwise, he will remain suspended between the two worlds with a shattered ego, his purpose and meaning undivined. And you see that when he's inverted, you know, he does look like he's dancing a jig, you know, he, he looks free. So that's today's. I agree. That's a good, great. Another, uh, I, I could just listen to your delivery uh, all day, Gary. It's mm. wonderful. They're too kind. But, yeah, but um, it reminds me of one time, uh, Aniela Yaffe, you know, who was the Young's uh, secretary late in life, 
uh, you know, learned how difficult it was to deal with Jung because he was, uh, you know, uh, he, he could, he would get upset at the, at the smallest thing sometimes. And uh, uh, one day was particularly frustrating and uh, she, she was about ready to quit and she uh, stomps out the door and she finds Young standing there looking at Lake Zur Zurich upside down through his legs. Okay, you know, he's bent over looking through his legs at uh, Lake Zurich and he tells her to do it too. And he says, this is how we really see it. He said, the, the image that comes into our eyes is, is upside down. He says, our brain turns it right side up. So everything we're seeing in our brain is physically, the image is inverted. So he said, if you look at things upside down, you get the true perspective, you know, which is, is pretty interesting. Uh, I think, you know, Ed, Ed Young, uh, you know, uh, we're going to, going to go through these dreams. You know, you know, I was just saying this dream, this book, is so um, instructive to me in my own personal work. Uh, just some of these last few dreams have been very instructive, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, you, you know, the one that's that's the this best of these four series is the one I'd really like to do is uh, the one on the tree man. But uh, the others are equally important even and um so i was thinking of kind of rushing through them but we'll see I, i'm gonna just uh, take it by ear here but anyway um the uh um I, there, this second dream is I, I'll, I'll just see how i feel when we get to it okay so this these are the dreams of her second analysis uh so this is the second set of dreams and uh the first one is this a villainous looking man with a red face and a battered look comes to me and he summons me with threats to accompany him pretending to comply i go with him into the street and then i appeal to the passers-by for help he makes off with undignified haste and I laugh mockingly. Then a knot of people are standing around, various messengers coming at intervals, summoning, summoning me away, uh, uh, summoning men away in the group. At last, one man is called away to a house opposite. And then a whole crowd of people come out of that place to which he had gone carrying an injured woman, her face distorted with pain. Okay. Now, uh, as I say, these dreams, um, you think you, you know what they're about, and we don't. It's just amazing um, how uh, these, you know, the one thing I, I think that, that that's really palpable in this whole book is the voice uh, trying to get to know the consciousness of this figure that is sending us these images. What are they about? What is it that they're uh, trying to communicate to us? And why are they trying to communicate? You know, it's just a, a, a really a, 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 a great mystery story. And, uh, you, you know, one, one thing I want to do, uh, uh, there's a lot of things. I, I, uh, that's why I say I don't, you know, I might I start doing a supplement after this just um, to try to cover some of the things that we can't cover uh, in, in the uh, uh, session itself. But, you know, uh, th this is kind of what I think it's saying here. You know, individuation is not a 
individuation, by the way, means to become undivided. You know, this means that, uh, you know, uh, um, that we listen to both sides, that we're not a tree with leaves growing on only one side, and that we realize that, um, you know, our, uh, our proper role is to be uh, in service to a, a psychic or somatic totality. But uh, he says in individuation is not therapy. He's, he says, is it therapy when a cat becomes a cat? He says individuation is a natural process. It is what makes a tree turn into a tree. Now, so that, so you're asked, oh, we're asking, uh, what, what is this uh, communicant about? Well, that's one aspect of it, that, it, it, that we need, we, we don't grow as we should grow. But there is another aspect to it too. And I think it's, it's this one. Now this, this is from, uh, uh, I think his name's George Russell Wilson. He called himself A.E. He says, I, I'm, this is from his headstone. I moved among men and places, and in living, I learned the truth at last. I know I am a spirit, and that I went forth in old time from the self-ancestral to labors yet unaccomplished. I mean, I think, and, and the labors yet un, unaccomplished that we are uh, about is um, the ones of, of really uh, the, um, of, of the, the uh, original intention of whatever it was that brought life into about was that it wanted to become conscious in time and space. It, and you know what Alan Watts said, it wanted to see itself. Okay, so it goes through all these stromatolites and trilobites and everything, and it finally gets to the non knuckle walking hominids, you know, who gradually suddenly have this third perspective that's now separated from nature. Okay, so there's a polarity, there's nature. And there's a consciousness now that is not nature, okay? And this consciousness is to be in service to nature, to this wisdom that created the body. So, I mean, I think it's those dual aspects that we're, uh, we're not becoming a tree as a tree. Uh, is, it, is it therapy to make a cat a cat? Is it... Uh, therapy to make a tree a tree but i think there's that second aspect but anyway um this this dream uh there's this villainous looking man and uh and he's some you know you would think he's a negative animus figure uh he's the villain of the piece the antagonist to all that's good and virtuous in conscious intentions you know he bears a resemblance to the character of the station master who also seemed to act against her conscious intentions. And a, a villain is uh, someone of, of ignoble, uh, who's ignoble or low born. Now um, he is going to uh, summon her, okay? He's summoning, summoning her. And so it seems to imply that he represents some sort of unknown authority. Should she go with him to find out what he wants? That's what Adler asked her. And uh, uh, this was something she had never considered before. And it struck her uh, as a completely unthought of concept and impressed her. So this uh, possible response seemed to suggest, be suggested by the further events in the dream because um, after he, she rejects him and his summons, um, she takes refuge in the collective and the extroverted attitude. She appeals to the extroverted attitude, the collective passers-by, 
to protect me from this, this uh, representative of an unknown authority who's, who, wants, who is summoning me with a message, apparently. And uh, so thus she's cutting short the problem that was represented by the red-faced man. And, and then uh, it all ends up with, uh, she sees the injured woman. And so we could assume that this is an aspect of her own femininity, which has been injured through rejection of all the lowborn man stands for. Now, this is kind of the after this, because of this, you know, uh, the woman was injured after she, she rejected the summons from an unknown authority by the red faced man, or you could say the woman was injured because she rejected the summons from an unknown authority given by the red faced man. Now, um, uh, they, now the, this knot of people were uh, disappeared one by one that she's with. Uh, you know, they all had the same fate. They were all being summoned by people by some unknown authority. You know, and uh, these messages, messengers seem to represent some purpose of uh, uh, an authority with a purpose. By whom, this is Adler, by whom all superficial collective support is gradually shown to be unreliable. So all this uh, hiding in the crowd to get away from the messenger from the unknown authority is not going to work forever, you know. Now, the, the house opposite signifies a position opposite to the collective one. It's not outside, but inside. And, and uh, uh, there, from there, from the inside, from the position opposite, comes the consequences of her uh, rejecting the summons from the unknown authority. You know, uh, this... Um, so we can assume that this injury would not have come, a, come about if she had uh, uh, accepted the summons. And it, it's, it's significant that in the words of the dream, he's not a villain. He only is villainous looking, you know, he's red faced. Um, and so that's her fear of him, the fear of her conscious mind of the, these, this unconscious part of her uh, makes her see him like this. Um, you know, I was thinking yesterday, and I really have been thinking a lot about Charles saw the, in this dream, all these people on an icy iceberg. But I just think that, that it, was the, it was our perspective that made him look like this, our, our fear of something or our inability to do something. You know, so so he is this um, part of her spiritual potentialities, which she has repressed and has become uh, now asocial. Now, this is, you know, this from al alchemy. He doesn't seem dangerous. You know, as soon as soon as uh, the passers, she is, talks to the passers by, he runs away in undignified haste and she laughs at him and uh, she. They, this is a thing, this is a, a, a part of alchemy that the lapis is found amongst the vile and the cowardly figures. <laughs> so, so one can uh, understand her situation basically is very similar to the one of the beauty and the beast, except here the beauty refused to love and accept the beast. And thus, instead of changing him constructively, she gets changed herself destructive and so this seems to be confirmed by her following dreams uh this dream series you know is a mosaic it's a jigsaw puzzle and we we find out many many things from the series that we wouldn't find out from one okay here's the second dream of this same night four of them 
she is watching an air battle. One airplane is shot down and she says, it's German, but unknown people are there to say, no, it's British. And that shows, and then the dream ends. So this is a symbol of, of a conflict uh, is evident and it's, uh, and so is the insistence of the dream ego that everything is fine. Oh, it was a German plane that was shot down. But it's pointed out to her that not ego, but the other side is victorious. <laughs> this is also so interesting. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, you have no idea. In, this is February 1941. How alone Britain was, you know. Norway had fallen. France had fallen. Belgium. Uh, the uh, um, Holland, Denmark, Poland, Italy, France, it stood all alone against uh, this, the continent of Europe. No help anywhere, you know? And uh, yet this dream doesn't seem too concerned about this. <laughs> you know, no, it was British. The British plane was shot down. So anyway, um, the, uh, uh, it, it is this uh, uh, ego has reversed the values. The final words of the dream left un, were un, left unspoken. This was exactly as in the swastika dream. But in that case, she interrupts um, the analyst who's going to tell her what the left turning swastika on ancient temples meant. And she says, no, I don't want to hear about it, you know, uh, because it makes me uncomfortable. You know, it not, uh, both the political swastika makes me uncomfortable and the non-political left-turning sunwheel makes me uncomfortable. So it's a riddle. What it shows something, what does it show? Um, you know, she finishes it later and that shows that you have backed the wrong side okay she backed the wrong side so this is again it's it's a it's a restatement of the first dream you know the fact that uh she uh, stood with the crowd and not with the villainous looking man who from the unknown purpose of authority um so uh this now this this next dream you know I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, let's go through it, but it's going to take a whole period to uh, go through this dream because it's it's has so many levels. And I maybe I'll just go through the different levels on it. Okay, so this this is a dream on February third, nineteen forty one. She is uh, talking to a man, and he's expecting some kind of revelation, which will enable him to begin some ceremony. The sign will be that he will see lights flash in his eyes. And he is uh, standing opposite the man and he's wearing a rather valuable uh, brooch made of five good sized diamonds set in a row, five in a row. The, now the sun is shining. And so she manipulates the brooch so it flashes light into his eyes. And he's very much excited by this. He thinks it's a supernatural light. So in other words, the revelation has come. He's experienced the initiation. And she says to herself, but this is dreadful. I must explain it to him that I was playing a trick. But how on earth am I to explain? Now, I'm going to tell you something. This dream not only describes her situation in relation to these previous two dreams, but it also describes every one of us. And it not only it describes every one of us, it also describes the last 2000 years of Western history, especially the last thousand, the one of the antichrist, you know, the one uh, basically of the ascendance of, of, of ego, uh, uh, the anti-self, um, the enthronement of reason, 
at Notre Dame, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the ascendance of science, the Industrial Revolution, where the pendulum has swung all the way in these last dying breaths, gasp of the Piscean Age. It has swung altogether far away. Now, now Young said that it won't be for 600 years that that pendulum will start to swing back uh, noticeably. And then it will only be one quarter of the way to the other side, to the one of, of, uh, of, of Aquarius. And then at that point, it's gonna approach the one of the goat fish, you know? So uh, this, this is, is really a dis is describing the ascendance, the <laughs> it is describing the enthronement of reason at Notre Dame, you know, of the God, goddess reason, you know. So anyway, I mean, it's just, it's got so many levels. I mean, maybe we can just sum it up a little bit. Um, now, uh, the man was uh, the one that she told uh, her labyrinth dream. So he's a psychological man. He gave encouragement and, and introduced her to Young. And if ever there was a dirty trick, it was played in this dream. And, and now it, the dirty trick was played on many, many levels, morally, but also psychologically, you know, uh, morally seemed to bother her more than the psychological aspect. And it's as if her unconscious, the positive animus, there's nothing uh, red faced or villainous looking about this man, you know, and it is it um, is if um, her uh, unconscious, the positive am animus was prepared for something really great and constructive to happen, an initiation. And all she can do is to cheat him by ego manipulation. So uh, instead of turning herself to the unconscious process and submitting it to it, her dream ego manipulates the light of the sun. Now, this is very interesting because she's going to be using two things of highest value, the sun and diamonds to trick the, this psychological man. Uh, it, it use, using it for only what only can be described as cheating. Now, here's what Jung says about spirit, okay, which uh, I had not really read it. And this is what I was describing to, um, to uh, Gary and, and John and Aline and Diane uh, earlier, uh, which I think Adler does, um, is he was the interpreter of the German uh, translation, uh, the in translation of the German of Young's early works into English until Princeton and RFC Hull took over. Now, Psychological Types and a few other books were translated by Peter and Carrie Baines and Barbara Hanna did some. But he just seems to have a subtle insight into the nuances of some things that are very practical and not theoretical at all. But anyway, it, it called to mind him uh, to Adler, this, uh, this from Young. Spiritual revelations are by themselves a trickster. For they reveal in the most convincing way without in the least approximating to a genuine insight. The genuine insight, you know, cannot come from spiritual revelation. It can't be achieved uh, unless there is the, the participation of the psychic and the somatic totality, and particularly of the feeling function and the sensate function. Now, uh, the, so she's really using black magic. That's the psychological aspect. Uh, the, the, so this friend was this intuitive person. So it means her ego is using the intellect. Now here's her two conscious functions, intellect and uh, sensation. She is using intellect and sensation 
to uh, cheat intuition. So she's uh, frightened of her own intuition and that uh, leads uh, to her use of the intellect and sensate functions to cheat it. So instead of honoring her own intuition as a value emerging from the unconscious, she rejects it by a fraudulent act. So in the dream, she's using her ego and her will in a thoroughly negative way. Now she did that when she ran into the collective crowd uh, to, uh, to escape the summons from the unknown authority, the message from the unknown authority. So now, now the dream goes very much against her conscious attitude. Now this is so important here. So much so that she condemns it in her own dream. It's not her conscious ego that commits the fraud, but it's, it's the unconscious counterpart by its immorable, immoral and unacceptable action. So it's clearly a shadow figure. But what's interesting here is who is the shadow? It's she is the shadow. You know, my wife often has these dreams. I mean, she's an AA. And, and, you know, a lot of people in AA have these, what they call drinking dreams, you know, where they, you know, they've been sober 30 years, but every night they have a dream that they start drinking again. And yet who comes to save her, her daughter, her golden child, and says, you shouldn't be doing this. Well, that's her. That's the new her. So she's sitting there occupying her old shell in the dream as, as her ego is. So um, anyway, um, this, uh, and, and boy, boy, can any of us escape this? <laughs> I mean, I can, I mean, I, uh, it, it's, it, to, be, to be fully conscious is not easy. And you know, we think we're fully conscious, but we're secretly unknown to our own conscious intentions possessed by the shadow. So, um, you know, she is, uh, um, uh, it just shows this remarkable split in her ego personality. She, she, her conscious ego personality contains a dark element which counteracts and undermines its own positive intentions. So uh, this is where ego is, is and the shadow are identical. Now, this comes up with that word that um, Angelique hates, you know, is is either hyper ego or hypertrophy of the ego. Now, uh, the way to look at it is, is what's the opposite? It's the atrophy of the instinctive. It's never used. So, you know, um, it, it would be like if you were blind, your hearing would become more hypertrophic or, you know, you would become a much, you would hear things no one else would hear. You would hear movements in the air, you know, that no one else senses because you don't have sight. So you can feel the movements in the air that other people aren't conscious of, you know. But uh, so um, she, uh, this, the, the, this is what he's saying. Ego is when it's ego is identical with the shadow. That means that um, the uh, ego has become a, uh, predominant it's been totally predominant it's not differentiated for one thing you know the ego is is just one big amorphous mass you know and uh, uh so now um it, it, the ego's aim if we were a cat that became a cat or a tree that became a tree the it, it's to be an instrument of a growing awareness of a psychic and somatic totality. And that's being fully conscious because basically the ego is saying, um, uh, you, you know, as John the Baptist said, uh, I must become lesser and you, the, the inner uh, self must become greater. You know, I mean, the, this growing awareness, you know, of the inner divine self. And uh, so now if, if there is a side of the ego, which is hypotrophied, there's also which another, another aspect which recognizes the problem 
and feels dreadful and is critical of its own action. So that's the hopeful sign in the stream. So here, you know, we have to take into account her type. She's in a, a, a uh, she, her unbel you know, very, very differentiated intellect and the masculinity of her personality. Now, masculine consciousness is logos consciousness. Consciousness, not masculinity or femininity, but masculine consciousness is logos consciousness. Feminine consciousness is eros consciousness. And it char a characteristic of the, of the logos attitude is, is uh, analytical faculties of discrimination, discerning ju judgment, and objective understanding. But the eros attitude is synthetic, not analytical. It's synthetic. So it produces a third. It takes two things, brings them together, and produces the third thing, okay? The synthetic faculty of bringing things and people together. Now, uh, is, isn't that interesting? It's the logos attitude that is much more uh, this um, analytical faculties of discrimination, discerning judgment, objective understanding, basically science. Now, you can, you can say, what if you just fully developed in masculine consciousness? You become the greatest masculine consciousness ever. <laughs> Is that, are you done? You know? I mean, the, the problem is that that is so incredibly one-sided. Now, the, the, the feminine, so they both meet each other. You see how important it is to be whole, you know, to both be feminine and masculine at the same time. So this, this and you know, it's the I-thou. So the I-thou, you know, you have an I and a thou. What's the synthesis of the I and the thou? It's the I-thou. What is the um, discriminating aspect of the I thou? I am here. You are a specimen of the uh, Homo sapiens. You are an it. And maybe I could study you, you know, <laughs> and I will observe you and make observations, but I don't want to have any relatedness with you. I mean, that's the uh, differentiated uh, aspect of. of of discrimination, discerning judgment, objective understanding. But the, uh, uh, the I thou, the synthetic faculty of bringing things together is no, I don't want to be an I and I don't be, want to be a thou. I, I, I mean, I want to, um, th this is so important in the, in the aspect of the feeling function itself. It is, the, is not, it is the function of valuation, okay? what is most valuable to an instinctive, psychic, somatic totality, okay? What is most important? What is the highest value? Okay, that's what the feeling function is. Okay, so what is the highest value when I is, is, is there's an aspect of that that is a relatedness. And the relatedness is I see the other. I'm going to approach the other. And for the time I am with you, you are my highest value. Not myself. You are my highest value. Now that's the synthetic faculty of producing not, uh, the I has moved into the background. The thou has moved into the background. What is now before us is the I thou which is the synthetic third, okay? So that's what relatedness is. You know, that's what eros is. Now, um, anyway, that is uh, just this aspect of this um, wonderful description he has of, of the eros consciousness. Now he goes on um, that it's not a problem if she uh, uh, has a, uh, uh, you know that her her primary uh, or dominant function is 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 thinking. That's not a problem. The problem is when uh, she also um, has a bad relationship to the mother and to the feminine. 
basically to the instinctive world, you know? So it, it results in a, in a negative mother complex and it's the rejection of feminine values in favor of masculine values. And what are the consequences of her negation of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the mother and the feminine and her father identification? It's a disturbance of the instinctual sphere. Okay. And it leads to an atrophy of the feminine attitude and the, inst and the, uh, uh, and the integration of the instinctual sphere. So the emotional power of the mother, which she had a lot of problems with, her mother was very uh, overpowering. In her life, absolutely had to be overcome by the intellectual clarity of the father's world or the father's critical faculty. So this negative mother complex, uh, complex manifested uh, in, in, in an unintegrated father fixation. This father fixation was unintegrated and it accentuated uh, the undervaluation of the feminine values uh, with masculine. So this masculine aspirations um, accentuated the animus aspect and led to a fear of everything dark and ambiguous. Anything that is not uh, uh, f full of, of the clarity, uh, the intellectual clarity of the father complex is, uh, um, is uh, something to be feared. Um, and to this, this, uh, this uh, dark and ambiguous uh, realm uh, uh, belongs the instincts, the instinctive sphere, emotions in general, the feminine, the unconscious itself, which is nature, which is the informing wisdom of nature, is the unconscious. Though it's Sophia, the lunar, the night, and the earth. Now, um, this is a now I know Sophia does not have a womb, so let's also throw throw the great mother in there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So as a, this is opposed to reason, detachment, and the clarity of the sun and of daylight. So um, this produced this psychological predominating contrasexuality. And whenever uh, it exists, whenever uh, a psychological predominating contrasexuality, in other words, a woman or a man who is either identified uh, with the mother or with the father. Uh, they're contrasexual, you know, uh, and with the animus or the anima, there's a corresponding exclusion of the consciousness. There can be a corresponding, uh, uh, it's an intrusion. It, what we have here is, he says, this is young, uh, uh, is a forcible intrusion of the unconscious, a corresponding exclusionist of the consciousness specific to the other sex and a predominant predominance of the shadow and of contrasexuality systems of symptoms of possession possession so it's a situation it helps explain the presence of the strong shadow element inside the ego that you can't that seems so conscious because ego has not undifferentiated so it's this uh ego is hypertrophied and thus turns against itself by rejecting its in its nature, its own nature, its instinctual fear. So um, instead of acting as the instrument of a growing realization of a psychic somatic totality, it acts as an instrument of exclusion of everything that seems dangerous and predominant to its limited surface values. Now, I, I want you to keep in mind, this is sort of describes the last three to 500 years, you know, instead of cooperating with the unconscious and using ego's potentialities and reverence for the whole, ego is only out to impress and to gain power. 
the injury to the woman in the dream uh, of the red-faced man acquires this a new meaning. Her ego's reluctance to accompany the neglected animus finds a much more obvious and negative continuation in this deliberate fraud committed against a thoroughly acceptable animus figure. Nothing wrong with him. You know, I, 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 I think one other thing, uh, we're going to come up uh, with just in a second and we're going to get up uh, into the uh, the point that I, I really wanted to express too is that this is this is this is exactly what happens with um, with when phosphorus, the bringer of light, has turned into the renegade Satan, Lucifer, the bringer of the dawn, uh, 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 phosphorus. The morning star is the son of, of, of Eos and Aurora, and he has a half brother, Hesperus, the evening star. You know, and yet in, in this case, this, uh, this wonderful divine figure, the bringer of light, uh, uh, dawn, Aurora, uh, uh, the morning star, has now turned into a renegade. And it uses the light of consciousness and the rays of the sun to stop the instinctual fear, the revelations from the psychic somatic totality. And it is in, in, in it, by its extreme isolation, it's splitting itself off from God. Well, isn't that exactly what Lucifer does? Uh, and this, so who is Lucifer? That is us, that is ego. You know, uh, Edward Edinger says that, that uh, Mephistopheles is the archetypal uh, representation of the ego arc, or he's the he is the personification of the ego archetype, uh, the the one that has split off from the instinctual sphere, you know, the so the divine uh, dynamis of the self is made subservient to the ego, this divine aspect, and then it really becomes demonic. The dream shows, uh, no, so what is happening now in our world? The dream shows what position uh, in her psyche is most questionable and doubtful because it's the most strongly and unscrupulously defended, uh, namely that of the manipulating dark ego. That part of that, that swing in the lat to the Antichrist in the second thousand years that has went all the way into that uh, direction. And it goes to show what a complicated factor ego is, the thing that we think we know the most about and is full of, uh, is full of unfathomable obscurities. And it includes in itself both the light of consciousness and the darkness of its own overreach. It's, it's overreaching. And uh, uh, now, so I really finished this, you know, I mean, there's, we're only about halfway through this one dream. And, and he spent a lot of time on it. But, uh, you, you know, the one thing I want to mention that, 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 that there's kind of come up a couple of redeeming dreams, you know, one is the two women analysts uh, who give her a, a, a word association test, and they, they're not going to look at surfaces like this so easily deceived analyst. The, these are the, the representatives of the feeling function want to say, no, we know something is wrong with you. And she had great difficulty doing the word association test. So every time they would say, oh, this was a, something Young came up with. Every time that she would say something, they would say something. They, that she would stumble over it, you know, because it was, uh, it was touching a, a nerve or a complex. You know, and the fact that there were two analysts, uh, this when this shows up in dreams, we talked about this last time, is it shows that something is becoming conscious, but it has a, a side that we are conscious of and another half that we still don't know about. And it probably will never leave that aspect. Uh, the one, though, there was uh, the second dream will be the one of the, or the last dream, the concluding dream will be the one I would really like to discuss in depth. But it's the one of the of the green man, you know, of the of the man of tree bark, you know, and we'll talk about that one next time. But uh, 
you know, uh, because it leads to the, the divisions of the of the of the comfortable and the uncomfortable tree. And uh, he says in the dream, I can do, and then she can't hear it, but I can't, what I can't do is something else. And uh, so uh, what she says that he, she thinks he says is I can, I, 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 I can't tell you about it, but I can show you and let for yourself. That's what the green man says. So the idea here is that the unconscious can't provide answers. But what you need or we need to do is it's going to show us, it's going to show us the dream. Okay. But it, it, it can't explain it to us. What we need to do is be Parsifal. And we need to say, what ails the father? To the dream, you know, to be the proactive aspect of these images. I can show you, but I can't tell you. So that's what the psyche is really saying. And you know, uh, I I just uh, had a, a a dream about the green man too. Uh, you know, uh, this green man appears with a face like a spider web, and he retreat. He says. You treat the world as your restaurant. Okay. In other words, I just go up to it and, and I say, well, let me see the menu. <laughs> let me see the menu. I'll decide what I want. I don't need you. And uh, so who's telling me this? The man with spider webs on his face and, and a green uh, face. In fact, it was so important to me. I, I really did a little bit of a sculpture of it, but it's... Uh, not very good. It was just, I just did it with Play-Doh, you know, but uh, I didn't really get the spider web on the face. But you, you, you know, I, I, I just conclude with, let's talk about spider webs. So, um, you know, I asked the anima, you know, I was asked, if I run out of questions, I just ask her uh, in act and magic. Well, uh, hey, you know, where did you come from? Who are you? And what she showed me was this, a spider's web. And every time I tried to do anything on the spider's web, she knew what I was gonna do before I did it. You know, before I even could move, the spider uh, knew what I was going to do. She knew before, you know, they, they've done tests of people who are going to, uh, uh, about to pick up something, you know, and before they can see that before the brain, the area of the brain that controls the hand uh, fires, you know, that something else fired somewhere else. So it wasn't the brain that told the hand to do something. It was the hand that told the brain, you know? So I, I mean, the, 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 anyway, it's just, uh, now, uh, so I'm just saying, I would say this, that, as we go through, one of the things that she's going to talk about, or he's going to talk about, is um, that when we, when she sees the tree man, the man clad in tree bark, uh, this is the uh, idea that the uh, that the animus has not di differentiated enough. You know, it's she, he's he's representing the feminine. But until we differentiate the animus, in other words, become conscious. You know, Jung said that shadow work is the apprenticeship. Of uh, integrating the anima in the animus is the master work, you know. But until you integrate the animus and the anima, you won't be able to see their contrasexual in, in most people. Uh, you know, myself, it's the anima and in most, uh, you know, in the majority of, of people who accidentally were born female, it's typically a, a male figure is the animus. Until those are, you will never see the self. All you will get is our intuitions of it. So she gets intuitions of the tree through the, tr the man clad in tree bark. 
Well, this is my own situation that I never, ever saw male figures other than the shadow in my dream. Now, in a woman, the self is, is going to be the one who, who, uh, who, who is, is the most consciously feminine. So it's going to be the wise old woman. And in, in the man, it's going to be the wise, uh, wise old man. So it was, wasn't until just very, very recently in my active imaginations did I start to be able to talk. In fact, uh, many, many years ago, I, I saw Hermes camp. I didn't see Hermes, but I saw his camp and I saw his fire. And I, I said, why can't I see Hermes? You're not ready to see Hermes. Well, lately I've been able to see him. You know, I bought this a long time ago, this little sculpture of Hermes. I don't know if you can see it, but is a, a, a sort of a, a Hermes forming uh, out, of, out of nothing. You know, I mean, he's forming in my consciousness. But anyway, uh, I just, as I say, a lot of these aspects that come up seem to be uh, things that come up in our own situation. Uh, this one dream is, is pretty important. You know, um, it really, it, it's important in one way is it's a threshold crossing. And yet it's not at all a dream of development. You know, it's a dream sort of, of showing the, the unbelievably hard obstacle that needs to be overcome. And I don't think this is just in her. I think this um, overreach of ego is the disease of this age. And that's something that, that needs, that we all need to overcome. Well, anyway, uh, I went over, I'm sorry. Gary, uh, do you wanna just open up the discussion then I'm- Sure. Um, wow, you know, I've gotta say this material is, I feel like we could go through this 10 times and then I would feel like, yeah, I think I'm really getting this. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's almost ephemeral. I'll have it for just a split second and then it will kind of float away. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that's what I actually I was saying. Uh, after we get through with this, uh, we won't remember any of it. I mean, there'll be bits and pieces that we remember, but we're not going to remember the whole. And yet, the, the fact that we're, we get to be exposed to this dream series is going to give us uh, some, uh, uh, some hints of, 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 of who it is in our own uh, lives. Uh, what, what is the nature of the personality uh, that sends us dreams? Great. Elaine, would you like to start off? Yeah, I enjoyed uh, today's session tremendously thank you gary and craig really great stuff there the scholarship that's gone into this is just astounding to me and i'm learning so much more about understanding young and how he can how he can um relate to my own life which i find the book does as well with the dreams really great and uh yeah i've just been able to bring it into my own life and having been away for two weeks i've really missed the group just been busy with other things. And so, yeah, I'm glad to be back. And thanks to everybody here. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Uh, John. Yes, thank you. Um, and again, it's, uh, you know, like I too have been away for two weeks. I had uh, some things going on the last couple of weeks, but, um, you know, I've been keeping up with the reading um, because this book is so, uh, it seems like, <clears throat> there's just similar themes in my life. I'll just leave it at that. And, um, you know, I find it pretty amazing. Uh, just that the, the, the wisdom of the dream and the dream images, I'm constantly floored and in awe of that and how it, it just presents on so many levels. And, and um, I, I'm just so thoroughly impressed by Adler. I mean, there's one point, it's a little further ahead, but when he, it, it, in relation to the dream you were speaking about, Craig, about the, the bark man and her dreams about the tree. And he said, well, the, the symbolism of the tree is is pretty self-evident here. We'll just leave it at that kind of like we don't need to go into it because he seems to me that he has such a huge breadth of knowledge and uh, and and uh, of the symbolism of the tree. And that's what's so tricky, I think, about Jungian dream interpretation is that it's just 
specifically related to the Andelson at the time. And there's so much that goes into it. Why you can't just say, well, the tree means this in a dream. If you dream a tree, this is exactly what it means. It's so because it's so individual to the person. But um, uh, yeah, I just uh, I'm enjoying the uh, you know this book thoroughly, and um, I just uh, it just it gets me back into the books, and I have to read this with a dictionary because his command of the English language is, is so much better than mine, and he uses a lot of words that uh, you know I'm not aware of, but I was just perfectly appropriate at the time, and, and uh, something that you spoke about, Craig, about consciousness. I remember I don't remember where I read it or heard it, but somebody talks about the burden of consciousness. And, and that's what this process is, because it seems like the more, you know, the uh, the higher the stakes are, you know, you have to live up to that higher level. Um, and uh, that, you know, being um, it's just integrating this process into my life is it seems like that's the opus, you know, for, you know, for my life is to discover these things and and integrate them. So um, I really appreciate it, though. I'm glad to be you know a, a part of this group. Thank you. Yeah, I want to say just a little bit about what her associations with the tree is one is she couldn't understand how it could grow both down and up at the same time and and how that the uh, higher levels were impervious because of, of how deep the roots were, that the higher aspect was impervious to those winds, those mal mad and malignant winds that um, of bad pneuma or whatever that 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 uh, attacked uh, uh, her when she was so stony, you know, and uh, uh, it, it, it is, uh, you, you know, we're going to go through that in her drawing of the tree, you know, uh, the, the, the comfortable tree and the uncomfortable tree. Great, Angelique. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question. You mentioned something about um, the negative, I think it was Adler's, and the negative mother complex had to be overcome by the use of intellectual clarity uh, from the father complex? Well, what, what she, he said was, is that the emotional power of her own mother that so overwhelmed her, her only defense against it was the intellectual clarity of the father. So in other words, she protected herself against her own instinctual sphere represented by her, her domineering, overpowering, very emotional mother. She The only defense she had against it that she could see in her existence was the intellectual clarity of the father. Very interesting. Very interesting. So it, se it seems that Adler has, um, is able to see kind of um, the etiology, if you like, behind her um, uh, hypertrophied rash rational, rationalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The origin of it, you know, uh, seemed to be, it, although, she, you know, her psychological type was thinking anyway, yet uh, it just was sort of an accident that her, at the same time, uh, you, well, he says, you know, you being born a thinking function, Marie-Louise Montfranz was thinking type, yet uh, she, uh, uh, she didn't have the problems this woman had, you know. And uh, it was just the fact, uh, you know, it was just the, uh, I, I don't really know. I mean, the, the origins of it, the etiology of it, yeah, is he's trying to guess at. It, it's, it's very impressive, that, that thing. Um, and, and, and I think Marie-Louise von Franz also had a terrible mother, because I remember Jung saying when he suggested that she lives with um, uh, Barbara Hanna, uh, then he was asked, why do you suggest uh, she goes and lives with her? And I think he said, because I want her to see that not all women are monsters. Like yes, <laughs> that know, is so, absolutely true. You know, so yeah. it seems that Marie-Louise von Franz also had a mm -hmm. dense complex, but then it wasn't sort of 
with. But, yes. You know, Barbara Hanna got along probably as well as anyone with Emma Young. And, uh, you know, her father was a, was a deacon in the Anglican church. And uh, she, I don't know if you've ever listened to her or read her, but she was just the, uh, she was a babushka. You know, she was just this uh, wonderful grandmotherly type, you know, had a, had a very high pitched kind of a crackly voice. And it was hard to understand her when she talked, even though she was speaking English, you know, you have to struggle to understand what she's saying. But yeah, she was definitely... And, and, you know, it was also the fact that they were both single women. And, uh, you know, there's so many single women in the uh, Jungian sphere that it was, uh, uh, there were some uh, uh, that were, were married. I, I, one, I'm, you know, Jane Wheelwright and uh, uh, another one. Oh, Linda Fears David, who she, now she did uh, the uh, book. And if anybody wants it, I can get it. On on, uh, on the uh, women's mysteries uh, w that were uh, found in, in Pompeii, you know the Via of Mysteries. You know uh, she wrote a book about it. Yeah, the Villa de Misteri. Yeah, she's, right. she's the one. Oh, she's I have the book. Yeah, it was L Linda Fears David wrote that, and she was she was a wonderful mother, and by and she wrote an essay on the mouse one time on just what the mouse means in the feminine as uh, into women. And it is one of the funniest, but the most insightful things I ever read. She didn't write a lot. I think she also wrote a book uh, called The Problem of, of uh, Polypho, uh, P-O-L-I-P-H-O. Um, but um, anyway, she was a, a wonderful married woman. I know. think she died just after she wrote the book of the yeah. Villa de Misteri, and yeah. I think it was oh, that might be. the Jungian sort of, um, a Jungian man, I don't remember his name, seemed to say that it was the work of her life and yeah. accomplished, then she had she had to go kind of, so that was. Yeah, a Emma Young was uh, an analyst too, and uh, uh, people who went to her were uh, very impressed with her. This introverted uh, sensate, you know, uh, you, you, you know, uh, 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 von Franz described her one time that the uh, the extroverted sensate when they throw a party, it's all surfaces. You know, everything is it, it looks like uh, the palace at Versailles, you know, but it's all light and surfaces. You, you know, I was thinking, too, in this book about uh, about light uh you, you know the the where where the uh as opposed to the dark and the ambiguous uh, and the fact that her light was not very close to the feeling function you know where you find light close to the feeling function is in the impressionists you know uh impressionist painting uh you know it, a lot of the impressionist paintings ended up in, at the art institute in chicago because none of the french estates liked it in fact they kicked it out of the of the uh, uh of the yearly exhibition that they had and uh, so they had to form their own and it and uh, but somehow the all the chicago railroad billionaires loved them so they painted you know they bought all these monets and and renoirs and stuff and they're all in and so you walk in the in the in the big auditorium of, of the Art Institute in Chicago. And here is this, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, a Monet water lilies or something. And, and this room is so light anyway, but when you see it in reality, the light and the feeling that come out of that art is just incredible. You know, but then Emma Young was an introverted sensei. So when she throws a party, it's all uh, try to focus around ritual and ceremony, trying to create uh, sort of these uh, aha moments, something like the Japanese do when uh, in their architecture, when you walk from one room into another room, you're supposed to experience a complete difference in space, spatio-temporal 
uh, atmosphere. <laughs> you know, you walk from this intimate enclosed room into this fabulous open area, you know, or something like that. But anyway, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, and uh, and it's also interesting. My my wife would just have loved to live in that era of all these um, fabulous women, you know, uh, Lillian Fry Roan, uh, of course, Carrie Baines, Tony Wolf, uh, you, you know, uh, Hilda Kirsch, and Yella Yaffe. Uh, there was uh, uh, when is, some, when is, the Ribka Kluger. Uh, was another one. Yeah, go ahead. When I started analysis, I was really saying to my female analyst, I was really worried why all these women look so masculine and why were most of them alone in their lives? Yes, that's um, Because doesn't that say something about how the analysis wo has worked for them? I thought back then, I am not sure now, but they even Louise von Franz, you know, she, she was very pretty, but then she looked quite masculine. Yes. And she was quite masculine in her ways. Marion Woodman was very feminine. Yes. Um, Angelique, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I saw an analyst when I was in Florida and I picked her. She was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, she was a, an older woman, but she was incredibly pretty and very, very intelligent. So, um, but I understand what you mean about that. I love Von Franz. I just, to her, I found her voice soothing and, and her insights amazing, but I just wanted to interject that, but I, I see what you mean. Yes, thank you. Yes, I was, yes, I'm not talking so much about their appearance, uh, um, but as they, how they were coming across. Yes, right. Yeah, in, in Von Franz's, go ahead. Yeah, what do you think of Von Franz uh, as, uh, as, uh, as what do you think of her feminine consciousness and Matt, you're just your impressions of her. Do you do you find a, 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 a imbalance or, or I mean, just, I'm just asking. Amazing. I don't know. Amazing. I found yeah. a, a YouTube video on what is love for her. Yeah. And I was I was amazed because she said um, love is 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 a truly highly differentiated feeling in which we are able to see the other person in their uniqueness. Otherwise, we cannot make them whole or heal them. And then she goes on to explain how she works with her clients. And it was, you know, it was goosebumps. Um, I will send it to the group. I yeah. think she was such a warm, loving, yes. quality. Yeah. You, you, you see pictures of her and, and whoever she's with, she, she takes their arm and hugs it you know uh, she doesn't just sit with them you know she takes their arms and and hugs it and and you know one thing i also you you know they they, they wrote a, a wonderful book called the uh it's 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 a tribute to von franz after she died i will definitely send that i've heard some people just love it yes. Every, everyone's sending their tributes of of, of von franz but is that the fountain is that the yeah the fountain of, of wisdom yes. or something Lovely. Uh, yeah, yeah. But one, one of, of, yeah, what is it? Um, Mary Louise von Franz, the fountain of love and wisdom, I think. Yes. Is it? And it's, yeah. it's amazing. But I think she had this steadfastness of yogi teachers, this deeper meaning, perhaps because she had been Jung's pupil, Jung's initiate, if you like, where love didn't always mean because she mentions that in, in the video, didn't always mean, because she said, love is not this Christian sweetie pie, chocolate, uh, strawberry, she says strawberry sauce thing. You know, sometimes when you are not true to yourself, I have to take my distance, otherwise I don't love you. So I think for me, she models the analyst who is constantly alert because it's tiring. That's what she says. It's tiring to love that way. You are not giving in all the time. You are regulating um, your, your, your presence and you are modeling through the warmth 
of the connection of this I thou every time. So every time as the analyst, you um, are constantly mindful and grounded to reflect how close the client is to their own truth. So if they are getting closer, you are warming up. This is love. You reflect their love to themselves, to their higher self. When they are getting, it's like this children's game we used to play when we would you know the hidden object and then fire fire when you approach but then cold cold when you are losing it so and and she was asked i think uh, is this difficult and she said it's extremely tiring to love so it's not the usual sweetie pie as she says kind of love we would we all are seeing you know or the uninitiated is seeking into erotic relationships or analytic relationships or friendship is a different kind of love. I think that's the reason why she might come across as distant, but actually is that highly differentiated feeling function she had achieved in the proper definition of being able to love. So it's the capacity for love, which doesn't go with all the sweet by uh, collective you know, ideas we can all get of that love. And it's truly, truly what, what an analyst, what kind of analyst one can be in order to wake up, help a client who seeks to wake up, who is seeking to wake up. So it's, it's you, you know, I think one of the aspects of it being tiring is that it is synthetic, you know, it isn't, uh, it, it, is, it is something that you're creating. Or, or exists between, you know, there's this aspect of that it's not, it, it is, is a, a, a sort of a sacred aura that a, appears if it really is, is tan palpable or tangible. You, you know, one, uh, I, I was thinking um, that, that one of the things, uh, oh, I just forget what I was gonna say. It was something that as you were talking, but yes, that's so beautiful. Uh, uh, that um yeah well I, I'll, I'll maybe if i remember it later i, I just had it in my top of my head but go ahead I will, yeah. I will definitely send the video thank okay. you okay thank you thank you angelique uh mervyn do you want to go next um yeah i sorry i i've really appreciated uh, craig in particular and i need to go soon and uh, i'm really sorry that i'm not able to slap very very late here but these two things things I just want to really bring up about the discussion today, which I think are really um, useful, or certainly for me. The one is about the sexuality of the historical I, um, the, the, the analysts. And I think in union circles, um, you know, I don't think the thing is to play sexual detectives in terms of people's closets. But I think one of the things that we, as in the union community, are very inclined to do is to, um, is to take away people's sexuality and their sexual preferences and where they were, and then kind of create the sexual mystery around people's, um, around people's lives. And I think it's particularly, um, you know, it's come out today, I think in these allusions to women, these mysterious women that kind of don't get involved in heterosexual relationships. So I think it's quite a complex thing. Um, I just raising that, not, you know, not as a, kind of like activist thing or in terms, I'm just thinking in terms of the way our uh, format in, um, in therapy um, tends, to, um, tends to minimize um, relationships between, between women um, and, and in, in particular. And um, yeah, so that's the one angle of, that I wanted to kind of bring up. And then the other thing was actually, I want to thank you for you used the word when you're talking about the dream, about you used the word stone. She had a stony, you used the word stony. And it, I had a very special experience today. And I, and, I, and I had some learning that happened here today that I've never actually thought of it in that way. So you were talking about the sensing, thinking function and how the, the shadow of the intuitive feeling and the kind of pressurizing. And I love the word you said, like the apprenticeship. The shadow is the apprenticeship. And I just, that was really so powerful for me. And I just wanted to um, share something that happened earlier today for me, uh, which I've never thought of it like that. Um, I was out with my family and we went 
Um, I'm in Cape Town at the moment, and, and you know, uh, for those I'm sure virtually if one year knows, there's a Table Mountain, which is like really pushed out of the sea, and it's like it's it's a it's a landmark um, ge geological feature in the world. And we went to a place I've ever been to before, which is a, a walkway, a, a community walkway. And part of that walkway, which was quite amazing, was they actually have geological markers. And it actually shows you that the, that the, 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 the various pieces of earth that came from different places and how they pushed up against each other. So what you actually see is a, is the, the mountain, but the mountain actually comes from very various um, places. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's where the earth's crust kind of came together. And I, I, I found that quite amazing today. And when you were talking today about the different functions and, the, and, and how they fit together, I thought to myself, wow, that is actually an amazing way for me and I'm sure other people to actually understand the way that Jungian, these constructs that we kind of describe as like pushing up against each other, like rock formations. And that they actually, um, yeah, that, 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 that the, the, the actual part of the sensing thinking or that it's actually like different continents that are actually pushing each other. And it's a different way of understanding it. It's a very powerful way for me about, for understanding about the, um, the way in which these complexes can be understood, or the, you know, the, how, the, how they can be understood. Yeah. So anyway, that's just my, 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 my yeah. Plate tectonics, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> the, the movement of yes. the plates. You, you know, I had I live on a, a three hundred deep foot deep bed of limestone. Okay, that was all the crustaceans that fell to the sea floor over millions and millions of years and had their mm -hmm. shells become limestone. And that's where I live, three hundred feet deep below me. Everything around here is clay, which is the uh, and, and Angelique, I was going to tell you just uh, what, what I was going to say is what, re what really kind of amazes me about Bon France and embarrasses me a little bit is how frank and open she is about sexuality. You know, I mean, she somebody asks her, uh, you know, somewhat graphic sex. She she knows. Yeah, I know all about that. You know, I mean, she's she's very earthy, you know. Well, thank you, Marvin. Um, we should probably go on. Uh, Maria, do you want to go next? Are you there, Maria? Yeah, Ma Maria, if you um, if you have your uh, it put, make sure you put your email in the in the chat, and and if you can un unmute, would you, maybe you could just tell us where you're from and. And welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you. Maybe she's uh, not there. Let's go on to uh, Quendron. I I can say Maria I, uh, is a friend of mine, and I am so happy that she is here. But <laughs> and she is uh, very well educated. But maybe she isn't. Um, I don't nope. know if she she has gone, but. Uh, of course, okay. uh, when it's better to to participate in a dream group the first yes, time, I think that's fine. In, in that's great. Well, uh, that's that that tells us a little bit. Thank you, Ava. Yes. Yes. Well, go ahead, Ava. I, um, Quantum didn't have anything, so <laughs> yes, it was such a hard lesson today. I, mm. I'm thankful I can listen to it afterward. Yes, yes, you were very long and so complicated. Oh, good. and I am. I think I'm educated but this time i i lost a lot i i am uh, sorry it, you know i was i did not really yes, want to go through yes, that you were dream. really complicated yes <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if i should remember i was hesitating but i you know i just thought it was so important yes yeah, and i know what you're talking i about. will try to get it later 
Right. Yeah, I kept I wanting to hit pause to digest, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm what sorry. Did... I, you, you know, I was thinking of doing a supplemental afterwards and sort of just hitting the high points. But, you, you know, as John was saying, it's very dense. It's really hard to ignore, ignore certain parts. Yes. I had, a, I had a professor at the seminary who uh, we, he, he fully admitted far hosed us. And he had the same kind of intellect that you do, Craig, where it's just massive. And uh, he apologized, but it was on the Myers Briggs, I think. But it was really funny um, that that's what I always feel that I've been far hosed with information. And it's wonderful. I mean, I, I need it, I just bathe in it. Thank Very you, Ava. Fair. I don't pretend to be that smart, though. Oh, uh, Diane, would you like to go next? Hi, um, I'm traveling, so I haven't been able to be as attentive as usual. But I would like to, like everyone else, I think uh, I'd like to better understand how uh, when a part of oneself is suppressed how the contrasexual doesn't appear in the, in the opposite, in the uh, anima or the animus. So I, I would like to maybe, it'll, maybe it'll clear, get clearer as we go. And if not, maybe if we can talk about that a little bit more next time. Just, and you know, the fact that you talked about the, um, the shadow or being, or the, um, what did you call it? Sorry, just escaped my mind. The, um, as the, someone in training, whereas when you're uh, differentiating the animal or the animus, it's the master. That's yeah. very interesting. I'd like to better understand. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, yeah. I appreciate how, what depth you go into it. Thank you. It, 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 you, you can see how difficult, you, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't say I know anything about my shadow. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure Young did, you know, but the, the idea is uh, uh, that part of you that just uh, operates uh, contra to your pot, your, your uh, uh, intentions of some observing part of you, you know, I mean, what, what von Franz says is that you need to be both in the arena and you need to be sitting in the arena watching yourself you know and it's this one up here that is uh that that and this one down here has more of the shadow elements and this one up here is saying what are you doing down there you know uh you know it's it's and it's sort of like me you know I try, trying to steer two boats you know i've got one boat here and i'm trying to also steer a boat that's far ahead of me. And then it goes around the curve. And now I'm trying to steer a boat I can't even see. Yeah. Great, you know, great analogy, great analogy. I was thinking too that, yeah, just to be in that observer, uh, uh, play, to be the observer, that's very important always. Yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult to integrate the one in the arena and the and the one watching uh, is not easy. Great. Well, I think that's everybody, uh, Craig. You well, are, you um, thank you, everybody. Um, you, you know, I think once we get into the, uh, I spent a lot of time on this dream, you know, um, and and I, I I really was just saying, hey, you know, I'm not, I'm just going to skip over this dream. I'm going to do it just separately all by myself and put it up there as a supplemental. You know, I think once we get into the tree dream, uh, will be, uh, uh, you're, it's going to be flow more like, uh, uh, not, not be so, but I think going through this thing, I, I mean, I just saw so much that is the impediment to doing this work, you know, in this thing i mean this is how difficult it is because of of the uh, of the how, how difficult it is to to take this thing that we've overvalued all our lives 
and suddenly uh, it's not we're not going to let it be dominant anymore and we're going to let another uh force become the dominant that's very scary you know to to this one that's giving up control you know well anyway well thank you everybody and thank you gary and thank you uh ava and angelique uh, you're wonderful uh help there and and john and diane and ken dream and thank you. we'll we'll see you guys all next time thanks guys thank you yes. craig thank yeah. you craig yeah bye, bye. bye guys bye